Good afternoon and welcome to today's program, Treatment Plans for the Difficult Patient. I'm Julie Miller, Editor-in-Chief of Addiction Professional. Today's program is the Foundation's Recovery Network webinar sponsored by Millennium Health. Thank you to our sponsor and to everyone in our audience for giving us your time and attention today. Before we get started, let's review some housekeeping details. To move a window on your screen, just click and drag, or you can enlarge and minimize windows by clicking on the icons in the top right corner. There's a Q&A area to the right of the slides where you can submit a question at any time. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation. But if you can't see this area, simply click on the red Q&A button. To download a copy of today's presentation and related information, please click on the link in the resources area in the lower left of your screen. If you have any technical issues during the program, please click on the yellow help button and we can definitely help you troubleshoot the issue. A special note about CE credit, to receive credit for today's program, you must click on the green CE certificate widget at the conclusion of the program and complete the evaluation form. If you're watching today's program in a group, please download the group submission guide and program evaluation form located in today's resources list and follow the instructions. If you have any issues with this process, we ask that you do not reach out to today's sponsor as they will not be able to help you in receiving a certificate. Please note, CE credit is not available for the archived webinar. It is only available for the live event today. And finally, you can also tweet during today's webinar by clicking on the blue Twitter icon at the bottom of your screen. Simply click the Post and Authorize buttons to log into your Twitter account and begin sharing automatically at the event hashtag APLiveWebinar. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Jennifer Angier. A veteran in the behavioral health field, Jennifer has more than two decades of clinical experience. She is currently the Chief Executive Officer of Black Bear Lodge, a 115-bed integrated treatment program of Foundations Recovery Network located in North Georgia. She is a Level 2 Certified Addictions Counselor. During her career in addiction treatment, Jennifer has worked in administration, case management, crisis response, and in private practice. Previously, she served as the Executive Director of Foundations Atlanta at Roswell and has experience as the Program Director of an Assessment Stabilization Unit. Jennifer earned her Bachelor's of Science degree from Georgia State University, graduating summa cum laude. She also has a master's degree in organizational leadership from Mercer University, graduating with honors. Jennifer, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with us today. And with that, I will turn the audience over to you. Thank you, Julie. And I want to thank everyone for coming today. I know this is Thanksgiving week and we've got family coming in and a lot going on in the office. So I really appreciate you taking the time out of your schedule to come and talk about one of my favorite conversations, which is talking about helping our patients find their way through a pretty difficult process. And so there's a lot to talk about today. I've, uh, I've got a lot of slides for you. Not um, most of them, but hopefully will be things that you can take with you and use in your own practice. So I just want to get started. So most of you have come to this webinar really, maybe you were attracted by the word difficult. I know that for a lot of us, we've had patients who are extremely challenging for us. Um, and that's probably what attracted you to the webinar. We've all had patients that we've thought were so so challenging that we didn't even know if we should do the work anymore. I mean, if this was really what we were meant to do, so many times after sessions, I've just sort of sat there and thought, what what did I just? How did I even help them? And I felt like a wall between myself and that and that patient. We've all spent time in our supervisor's office talking about you know, how to get this patient through to the next level. And oftentimes the only answer that we ever get is that they end up being discharged or they end up leaving. And I think there's a much better way for us to, to get there. But I want to start us off in a different way. I want to talk first about the term difficult and what that says to the patient and what that does to our treatment teams and what it really sort of how it sets us up to be different um, and from, from the place that we're trying to go. So I want to ask that we be willing to drop that term completely as our description of a patient. There's a couple of reasons for that. 
Um, when we use a term like difficult to describe a patient, we're not really describing what's going on with the patient at all. So a patient could be difficult because they've had multiple treatment attempts. They've been in and out of treatment. They've um, Maybe they've used in treatment. They've um, been disruptive in the milieu. Or a patient could be difficult because they don't even know if they have the disease. They don't even know that they belong in treatment. Two very, very different patients. And a term like difficult doesn't describe to the team um, what it even means about this patient. So we want to we really cannot just get to the solution of the problem if we're using a term like difficult. There's also, as you see on the slide, a number of other terms that don't really describe the patient, terms that we've heard in this industry for so long that we don't even really we don't even realize that we're using them often. So I want to try to take us on a different a different journey in helping us connect to the patient. I mean, even ASAM's description of treatment acceptance and resistance as a dimension can can be confused. We may say that that means that the patient is being resistant instead of really considering that it's their disease that's resistant. This is a very, very challenging disease to live with, mental illness is as well. And so we would expect to hear treatment resistant if we were talking maybe, say, about a patient with cancer. Um, after they did not go into remission, we could say that the, the disease is resistant to treatment so what we're saying really is that the patient showed up for chemo, the patient showed up for all the surgeries that they required to, but their disease showed up as well. And it's the same for our patients. They may have shown up for treatment, but their disease showed up as well, and they didn't have that moment where they could push through whatever the struggles were. So when we use that term, we get a block, I think, between us and the patient. So for example, at, um, at Black Bear, we, use, we work really hard to not use any terms like, say, for instance, drug-seeking. When you say a patient's drug-seeking, what you're saying to, if it's a nurse, let's say, talking to the physician, what the nurse is saying to the doctor is, this patient isn't serious, they're dishonest, they're, so just beware, they're trying to fool you. And I think an even more concerning message is, if you listen to this patient, if you provide them with medication, then you lack some sort of skills. So it's hard enough to really hear and discern what's going on with the patient without having all of that extra noise um, around the patient. Instead, we ask that they describe the symptoms. So if they feel that somebody is drug-seeking, we ask that they just talk through what does that mean? What is, what do you, what is the patient presenting? They're presenting with um, anxiety, uh, restlessness, irritability. Um, they're talking about a specific medication that they know that works for them. Um, their vitals are all in range. Their appetite's good. I'm not seeing any um, complications with their detox process. So that conversation is a way to describe the, instead of using a term like drug seeking. So the physician is able to really look through the symptoms. So it's in line with our practice to encourage descriptions like they're struggling with integration to treatment rather than they're being difficult, or they have limited internal motivation, or they report current past interventions aren't being helpful. So things like that describe the, the separation between what a difficult patient may look like um, as they all look, have different pr presentations. So, and another reason to not, to sort of step away from using the term difficult is um, when we use that terminology, we're still talking about it from the provider's perspective. A patient would very rarely use the term difficult to describe themselves. They would say things like, I'm hopeless, I don't know what to do, I don't want to be here, um, this isn't going to work for me. They would use much more descriptive terms of their life experience. And so when we're, when we're saying those terms, we're still coming at it from the provider standpoint. And when you take a patient-centered care approach, you really are trying to come from the patient's point of view. So... It wasn't really a trick that I used the term difficult. I, as I started to present work on the presentation, I really started thinking about that challenge. So that's really what I wanted to start with. But so let's move into how how do you help these patients get engaged in treatment? And I'm going to focus primarily on treatment planning. But I want to start with the relationship. And we've already talked about some pretty obvious ways that a patient may um, it may be challenging to develop this relationship. But it's it's really key in the development of a treatment plan that the relationship starts to happen between yourself and the patient. So we, re we need to help them know that we're listening and how we listen is different for all of us, the way we hold our body, the way that we respond back to them. We all have different sort of theories that we practice from, but, but we know when we are completely focused. And what I listen for is 
are, are little things, little little ways inside of them. I try to hear things that they may be talking about that are really important to them when they talk about how they ended up in treatment, what was the um, the defining moment when they knew that they needed to come. But during this this conversation, whether it's the first or third or fourth conversation as we're developing a relationship, the conversation turns to being about truth. And it's not, when we talk about truth, with the patient, we're not accusing them of lying. We're not. Um, we're, we're trying to help them recognize that's our goal. That's what we're looking for: is to uncover the truth about what matters to them, why they're even here, what are the things that spark their interest again, what are things that maybe have fallen asleep as a result of the disease of addiction. So we want to try to help them find and connect to the truth about who they are and also what it means to struggle with the disease of addiction. I try to stay away from the term denial. I talk a lot about that with the staff here and, um, and even to the patients. I don't find that term to be very helpful. Um, it just separates me from the patient even more. I, I, rather than when the times that denial would work as a, as a term, we talk in terms of stories, that the patient has the ability to create a story that makes sense to them, that moves them further and further away from the truth. And for those of you that have heard me talk know that this is something I am quite passionate about, about helping patients come back to the truth, moving through the stories that have blocked them from knowing that what, they, what really matters to them is even, it's even missing in their life. So it's all about um, trying to connect to that relationship that we're trying to build with them and telling them that this might be hard and asking them who's helped them in the past and what were they like and just getting to know how they, how they feel heard and, and um, cared for. So when the interview process starts, and really that's kind of what I call it for, for the treatment plan, is, and I tell them what we're doing, I, we, we talk first about what it even means to have a treatment plan. But the process of, of this coming to, coming to life is that we, we want to create a nurturing environment. But that's different for me, and it's different for you. I'm sitting in my office right now, and talking on a webinar doesn't feel like a very nurturing environment. <laughs> I'd much rather you guys all be sitting in my office right now. Um, but So my office might not be the right place where you don't feel as comfortable as a therapist doing your work. There are limitations, obviously, in the structures that we that we work in. But I see the environment as the space between us and the patient and that we tend to that. And it doesn't mean that we can just do our work anywhere, but it, but it certainly is that what, I, what we need to tend to, especially in developing the treatment plan. There's a lot of energy that flows between us and them. There's a lot of cues. There's a lot of different ways that we can get conversational with them that we're going to find out what is in their, what is in their story. So as we're as we're doing that, I talk to them a lot about their own personal resistance, and I, I'm mostly I'm just I'm curious. I'm curious about who they are and and what they've what they've done in the past, what has given them um, happiness, where they have been able to feel um, connected to to another human being. So I just want to hear that story, and I know this sounds like this could take a very long time, but it actually, as you direct the conversation and telling them what you're trying to do, you have a lot, of, a lot more opportunities to say, okay, we're not, we're not moving in the right direction now. I feel like I've sidetracked us. Let's, let's go back to what we were originally looking at. And I tell them that's probably going to happen, and then I'm going to have to get back on track because, frankly, because of myself more often than not. Um, so the interview process is, is about explaining to them what we're going to do. So I tell them about what we're doing. We're, we're creating a treatment plan. And the treatment plan more than likely is going to come up with assignments where they are actively engaged in the process. They may be teaching people things. They may be teaching me things. They may be asked to go find something, bring it back. Um, may be asked to use music. They may be asked to um, tell stories. But it's a, it's a process that really will engage them. And while I was pr uh, planning for this talk, I was speaking to a friend of mine and telling him about how I, how I talk to patients when we're creating a treatment plan. And he said, he said there was actually a name for that. He said it was kinesthetic learning. Where, and it's something that is used 
in children in developmental stages as they grow in the education in their education and um, he described an example that he saw his child's teacher use where the teacher said something like the sky is purple and his son said no it's not purple silly it's blue and the teacher's response was you're so right that was silly of me and so the, the child taught the teacher and that's how the child was able to learn and I think in so many ways, as I went through school, it was the same process for me. If I was able to teach one of my peers something that I, that I was trying to study, then it stuck with me. It, it, it opened up a door that otherwise wasn't open. And so the, the other thing that he said, which I put in the slide, I, I quoted him, was even compliant children do not want to be told what to do. They want to feel like they have some control. And I, I, I try to caution myself around the patients that aren't, pushing back, the ones that just seem completely motivated, that are in the process, they also need to feel um, a strong sense of control of the process, of the conversation, of, of the direction it's going. So it's a, it, this, is the, this technique, especially of the process of, of finding the treatment plan objectives, but then having the patient present the treatment plan objectives, I have found to be really, really impactful. So the patient will... Um, will have certain things that they like to do. There's certain, so music that they like or sports that they're, that they're involved in. So I want to know about that. And I know that it might seem far off from what we're trying to gather as far as their history. But by the time they've landed in this conversation with you, there's been a lot of assessment that's been done. There's been a lot of information that you can read about, their history, their physical, all of those things will tell you the story of how much, how often, all of the type of things that help you in some ways. But the treatment plan is about finding where their energy is, the things that truly matter to them. Sometimes they'll let you in, sometimes they won't, but that is also an important part of the process. That brick wall that might come up is, can be acknowledged, and that can be where the starting point, and that can be one of the objectives. So it's not about trying to be to take yourself away from what's natural to you. It's just about coming from that place even more naturally. And you'll hear a little bit more about my style. Um, it's going to be different than your style, I'm sure, but it's authentic to who I am. So when we, when we come to the next, the next slide where we're talking about how to actually create the plan, I want to, um, I want to back up a little bit and say that when we're asking the patient things that they like, I want to use an example. I, had, I was talking to this one patient one time, and I told them ahead of time, as I do with all the patients, we're about to develop your treatment plan. And I'm really excited about this. This is one of my favorite things to do. And I let them in on, on the secret of what we're doing. And I say to them that it's important to me that this works for you, that these are assignments that, that speak to you. There's going to be some things that I'm going to think are really incredible that I uncover, that you uncover, and I'm going to start marching down uh, a, diff a path that I'm going to be very, very excited about. I'm going to think these assignments are actually quite brilliant, and I need you to tell me that that's not the right direction. If I'm moving in the wrong direction, I want you to be a part of that and tell me I'm going in the wrong way. So, for example, I was talking to this one patient who was a Major League Baseball player, and I was automatically trying to find the door that opened for him. I assumed it was baseball. That's where I would sort of take baseball examples and I would use those kind of things to create different objectives as I understood what his goals were. And so as I started talking about it, he just stopped me and he said, can I, can I interrupt for a minute? And I said, sure. And he said, um, I really love football. This was a guy who was quite gifted athletically, obviously, and uh, he was um, scholarship throughout his whole college career in football. And as it turned out, for a number of reasons, he wasn't going to be able to go in that direction, and so he moved in the direction of baseball. But I would have never known that. I wouldn't have. I was going on assumptions that I didn't even know that I was going on. And so, as we talked about what about his position and what he what he liked about um, football, and the things, different things that um, were important to him, he's a, he was a quarterback, and he. I know very, very little about football, just enough to really make my husband crazy. Um, and so I, was, I said, isn't there a player that their only job is to just destroy the quarterback? And he said, yes, there is. And, and he said, it's the defensive lineman. And he started to tell me about who, what that position was about as he was a quarterback. And as he described it, it sounded exactly to me like the disease of addiction and, and his experience with it. 
And so we talked to he so he presented to um all of the patients in his particular group um a really incredible lecture where he described how the defensive lineman was similar to the disease and all of the things as a quarterback that he had to do to stay safe, the people that were there to help support him, how he had to watch, you know, films and all of those things and it just opened up a doorway in him that was already there and one that I wouldn't have found had I stayed just marching down the path and insisting on on it. And so he wouldn't have known that it was okay to tell me to move back in another direction had I not told him about, about that. All right, so I want to start talking about some some challenges, some patients, and this is really, again, why we are all on this call. And, I, and my hope is that I'm going to give you some things that you can take with you. These are actually assignments that you can use in your in your practice, or they'll get you to start sort of thinking about different ways to connect to the patient. I'll talk a little bit about different experiences I've had with these patients and how these assignments played out. And there's a couple of examples of, of um, completed treatment plan assignments. This is, for some of you, you have access to communities where the patients can present in a community. For some, these assignments would be better done in an individual session. And so it's really about trying to find the right places to um, have these assignments completed. So the first person would be a patient that would be coming to us just saying this is hopeless. We would typically say that this is a person who's had multiple treatment attempts and that they continue to relapse. And as if you scratch the surface, most of the time they're going to tell you it's it's hopeless. There's there's really is no point. They've lost the flavor for recovery. They've lost their connection to it completely. And they're just sort of going through the motions. And and understanding that and sort of giving that voice is incredibly empowering for them. It makes them feel not quite so alone. So different objectives as I've gone through this, this process, a lot of my experience has been with um, impaired professionals, physicians, doctors, lawyers. So I have the opportunity to, to assume, again, there's some pretty strong energy in different ways that they think. I will say that this goes against some, some people's ideas of, of what we need to do when we're treating a patient. Say, for example, a physician. I do agree very strongly that the patient needs to let go of their role of being a physician while they're in treatment. Um, they need to look at all the different ways that being a physician has um, has harmed them and kept them out there for longer, how they've been enabled by that, and how they use that position to sort of distance themselves from their peers. But when it comes to the treatment plan, sometimes there's access in what they do that is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's the way they think. They spent their whole life getting their brain to think like this. So, and that's really true for for all, for just about everybody that has something that they enjoy and they love. So, one of the objectives that I would give a patient like this would be to complete a relapse autopsy. Now, really, it doesn't have to be a physician to do that type of assignment. A lot of people understand what an autopsy is about. And so, they would describe what happened in their relapse in that type of a format, and then they would present that to group. Another one of my favorite assignments is completing a first step for untreated alcoholism. For this patient in particular, it's really important for them to understand that their problem isn't the relapse. Their problem isn't putting the substance back into their body. They made that decision sober, and so obviously it's how they live sober that is a problem for them, and that's really where they can, if they can start to see that the reason they can they have continued to relapse is because really frankly they're just being surprised by the disease maybe they didn't really believe that it was a disease maybe they just thought that this was going to be a little easier than they expected it to be my problem before was i didn't want to stop now i do and so problem solved and i really don't have to treat my disease so they've gone in and out um with that misguided definition of what the disease of addiction looks like. So a way to get them to understand that is to get them to do a first step on untreated alcoholism. We're all familiar with the process of a first step talking about what their relationship with alcohol and drugs is like. And sometimes that's really not very helpful. With a heroin addict, for example, most often they can do a fantastic first step, but they're not talking about the disease of addiction. They're talking about trying not to get dope sick. They're talking about everything they did to not use. So they're really not getting to the core of what we're looking for, which is um, describe the disease process in your life. So a first step for untreated alcoholism 
talks about what it's like to be them without alcohol and drugs in their body. And that is one slide I did not create, which I'm happy to send you all if you um, if you would like, send me uh, some information and, and I'll send it to you. But really, you could look at any first step and just switch it to um, just switch a couple of words and it would it would fit. Um, the next one is for the, most of these people that that feel hopeless or they or can't work, you start to have these conversations about spirituality and where where are they with their spirituality? And most of them are most of them are, are, are struggling mightily with making that connection. They they feel like um, while they've tried, God has either abandoned them or that's the whole problem is that God has to be involved in recovery. And so we and 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 frankly, they're tired of being in the same lectures as everybody else. They don't want to be in the same old stuff. I've done this over and over and over again. I could run the lectures. And so we create a process for them of a spiritual retreat, something that may seem like it separates them out from the patients, the other patients, and it does in some ways, honestly, because they have different goals for the day. But it's very, very individualized. So, so for example, in a residential treatment center, when they wake up, there'd be a little um, envelope at the end of their bed or right outside of their door, and it would be um, a letter either from their God or just from their therapist or whomever, and it would tell them what their goal was for that day spiritually. So maybe one whole day the focus was on them just being playful and just trying to get back in touch with what it felt like to have no preconceived notions of the way life was supposed to treat you. Another one would be um, a day of silence. And in that day of silence, you can build a lot of things into it. Underneath that, I put an objective that I actually do with the day of silence where the patient um, the patient would would be silent for the day, but the only interaction that they would have with other patients would be the patient another patient would come to them and bring them some sort of something that connected them to their higher power, something that meant spirituality to them, so it could be a rock, it could be a Bible, it could be a rosary, it could be um, a leaf, anything, and that patient would sit in front of the other patient hand them their item, and then they would tell them why it meant something to them. And then the other patient would sit in silence with that item for 20, 30 minutes and then return it. Another thing, so there's a lot of different things you can see that you can do on a spiritual retreat. I don't need to go into them all in detail, but it's, it's, a, real, it's a good way to help them feel like something different is going to happen for them in treatment this time. So the next challenge would be a patient that says, you just, you just don't understand. I am not like any of these people here. That, again, would be our, our you know, our CEOs, our, um, well, maybe even a young adult in an adult community. I'm not like, and I, I, and I don't want this to be over. Like, I don't want to, I don't want to be here now. I want more time out there. Um, you don't understand. You, you, you're just like my parents saying I'm a drug addict, so anything you tell me to do is going to be you trying to trick me into what they've been trying to get me to admit forever. So, Basically, what we were most of the time, this patient would be somebody that we would describe as someone that has an inability to see their consequences. They want to they want to keep using, and they're not able to tie those consequences. So, some assignments um, that are up here, I'll describe uh, one one that was really really fun to watch is have have a patient again presenting a first step, and we try to use other words besides first step because while we believe very strongly in the twelve steps, I think most of our patients have their own preconceived notions about that. And so telling them to do a first step, rather we're ask, we ask them, when I, what do you really want them to do? Not if you're, if you're asking them to do a first step, what are you really asking them? So say that rather than first step. So if you're asking this patient to complete their history of using and mental illness, what I've done before is I've had the whole group in there for the first step, maybe 10, 15 patients. And then at the end of that group, had each one of the patients go and find something um, that I that I assigned to them to describe what they heard. So I may assign one patient, go find a song and bring it back. To another patient, I would say, go find something out in nature that described what you just heard. To another, I may say, um, tell a story of something that you related to, that you heard in that first step. And to another, I would ask them to um, point out five ways that they still heard some confusion around the disease. And then to, if you happen to have one that's a good artist, I would ask that other patient to draw a representation of what they heard. So I have an example here of, of an assignment that a, that a patient drew of another patient's first step. And it was so powerful. This patient happened to be from Oklahoma City, and a lot in her life was around the traumas of tornadoes and, um, and, and the terrorism and things like that. So, but he tied in 
because that was her sort of excuse. If you lived where I lived, you would have the same issues, but he tied in a lot of other aspects. Interestingly enough, this young lady, uh, she texted me not long ago. It's been about 10 years, and she said, I'm having trouble remembering what it used to be like, and I just can't remember. And so I sent her this picture, and it was very helpful for her. So um, moving on to the next patient that we would see is I don't have a problem. This is I can just quit. This is a person that, again, doesn't understand the disease of addiction. Using opportunities, like I said before, of things that, that they can um, come in from what they already understand, having them, if they're an attorney, maybe having them prosecute their disease in a courtroom setup. Patients are jury. They choose their jury, all of that. And an attorney wants to win in a courtroom, and so they're going to they're gonna give more information about their using than they might other ways. Uh, an M&M, which is a, a process where a physician, if there is some sort of um, outcome that's unfavorable to a patient in the world of medicine, they have to present an M&M and describe what they did and in front of a room of doctors, and then those doctors sort of dig into seeing what they could have done differently. So obviously the first thing that this patient would say is, I've treated myself, and the physicians would also would respond back, we don't treat ourselves. Why would you choose to do that? So it takes you into a, um, a place where they're familiar and where they think, where their thinking is. Um, so uh, the last one on this is also for someone struggling with mental illness to give them an opportunity to present a history of their mental illness. So I've given you an example of a good, what you might call a first step on mental illness, where they would have to answer these questions. For example, number eight, describe how leaving suicide or self-harm as an option has kept you stuck. So creating your own questions or using a format like this to help them start to look at their mental illness in a way of just the small areas where they could make a difference um, and where they've been denying this illness in their life. So um, our last patient to describe would be, uh, as challenging would be, this shouldn't be happening to me. This patient is somebody, let's say for instance, who's a chronic pain patient, who never had a problem with alcohol and drugs before. As a matter of fact, they were exactly opposite of that. And now all of a sudden, not only do they have their pain, but they have um, they have addiction. And so they're angry, they cannot see it, they see all the other patients in the room as people that are drug addicts, but they are not. So trying to get them to, to recognize this, I had, I had a patient who she just she said it felt like she'd literally been kidnapped um, by her pain, kidnapped by the stupid doctor, she said, her words, um, that got her addicted to pain meds. And you can see the setup, right? She's um, if she, All she needs is to be out of pain. All she needs is to um, not need these meds, and then this problem is going to disappear. But if this is a, a young woman who has the disease of addiction, it's not going to. So we created this assignment for her where she had an Amber Alert, and you can read what that looks like, and, and that process was all about really describing who she was and how she felt like she had been kidnapped and who that person used to be and who the abductors were, trying to get her to describe the disease process. And 25 people would be her support network. These people typically feel very isolated from anyone, so they have to dig to think, who would, who would show up to try to find me if I was truly missing? And then the aftercare plan would be three different rescue missions instead of putting all your eggs in one basket. So what, what would be a way to help this woman? So trying to get her thinking about what it takes to get sober. The other was an example of an of a orthopedic surgeon that, that um, was able to describe that there are two different types of, of fractures in this one particular um, bone, in, a, in an ankle bone, and uh, one really looks bad, a compound fracture, and the other you can barely tell it's there, but they are equally as devastating to the, um, to the ankle as you move forward, but it's impossible to get a patient to understand that. So I had him do that lecture, and then I responded back with how that was very similar to someone that didn't look like a drug addict but still had the disease of addiction as he did. So um, I've, I've sort of moved away in these next couple of slides from from just trying to describe a particular patient and just giving you a number of different ideas of different treatment plan assignments that you could use, not thinking obviously that these are the only ones, but just sort of giving you some experience into the, to the ways that um, may be able to help access 
what patients are struggling with. A grandmother who hated herself and was so angry at herself for being in treatment again. And so that assignment of listing three things that she could do um, every day to treat herself like her grandchildren did because she loved her grandchildren and they made her feel very special. And that was just a little part of our conversation, but when she spoke of her grandchildren, it's like she came alive and she almost could believe what they were saying about her. So there was access there. Um, so other ones, um, just different ideas would be um, oh, the, the major league player. I had a patient one time, and you've probably heard this many times, I need to be out of treatment because this is not real life. I need to be out um, doing the real deal. And a patient described that one time as, um, I feel like I'm in the minor leagues and I need to be out there in the major leagues. And so we talked about what really happens in the minor leagues. Um, if a player is sent down to the minor leagues, I had him tell me. I didn't know. Um, I said, don't they work really hard? And he said, yes, they work hard. And I said, okay, don't they? I mean, they don't just sit around signing autographs, do they? I mean, if, are they going to make it back to the major leagues if they're just sitting around mailing it in? And so we talked about the importance of the minor leagues in an athlete's career and how being in treatment, while not trying to take him away from his judgment about it, but trying to help him see how important it was. Another young man who um, really struggled with uh, prayer, just remembering to pray. So you'll see the example was picking up a toy, and he had four kids, so there were a lot of toys laying around his house. Um, so there's a lot of examples in there that you, um, you know, had a guy who liked NASCAR, so he used that. He presented a lecture. Um, so uh, the last one I, that I do want to describe um, in this slide is the letter to the soldier. This was an example of how I went off track. This uh, lady was telling me about how much she um, was fascinated. She was a historian by by war, and um, and she I assumed that she meant by battles. So we started talking about you know Battle of the Bulge, a few battles that I actually know the names to, and she stopped me and said no. What she felt connected to were the actual soldiers. She had thousands of stories in her mind and in her heart about soldiers and what what their fighting did for her and for us and how fascinated she was that these were just young men, 18-year-old boys who risked their life and gave their life for our freedom. She also described her mental illness as um, stealing all of her freedom away. So I asked her to pick one of the soldiers that she felt tied to and to write a letter to him and to commit her sobriety, her mental health, to his battle and what he gave up and um, to really honor him by honoring her own recovery. Um, so again, just more opportunities to come up with different ideas of a garden. So I, so the point I'm trying to make is that there's just, there's so many different ways. If you, once you identify the problem, I haven't spent a ton of time identifying the problem because that's individual for each, pa each patient. But if you've taken the time in the interview process to hear what they're saying, then you can use that information to create a doorway into the objective that you're looking for. So the identification of the problem comes in the interview process and in developing the relationship and all the collateral. But now that you know all this information about, about them, you know the doorways that you can use to help them find what they're looking for. So how do you really audit that this is happening. How do you know? I mean, it's hard to say that this is really going on at your facility. It's hard to even, you know, we all say that we do dual diagnosis treatment, but do we really do dual diagnosis treatment? We all say that we do um, patient-centered care. But so the issue in our treatment plan may be a little deeper than just how we interact with the patient. It may be the whole system isn't as focused on patient-centered care as we think it is. So this is just my opinion. I love the DDCAT as a tool to help audit a program to see if they truly are um, treating the patient with a dual diagnosis. And it not only it, it teaches you different things as you as you go through this audit process. It's not punitive. It really does help move you in the direction of becoming more enhanced in your dual diagnosis treatment. At foundations, we also, because there's a number of uh, residential facilities, we have a system of care. And how do we know that one one facility is practicing the same um, techniques as the other facility is, our mission, our values? So we've created an audit tool for specific areas that are critical to us and our system of care. And then in my graduate uh, thesis, I look to try to find a patient-centered care audit tool and just decided to, to try to use the DDCAT to create that process. So really, 
you know, again, rem remembering that sometimes the patients are mirroring back to us is that our own system is not as healthy as we want it to be. So really believe strongly in in order to be able to create a space where we can be so creative, where our therapist can be so creative, we need to audit. So this is just one page of all three of those audit tools. I think this is a, about a 50-page or 40-page document, um, but this is just one page that shows some of the questions that you would look at if you were doing an audit on a DDCAT, seeing if you had the system of care and seeing if you had a patient-centered care approach. So, you know, we're always trying to remember that it isn't just maybe that wall that you're hitting isn't just about you and the patient or it isn't just about the therapist and the patient. There may be something bigger going on in the system. So always being willing to step back as an administrator um, and just say, there might be something bigger happening here. We have to we have to clear our environment so the therapist can do their work. Um, so that's just a, a tiny little bit of an aside, but it might not be. I mean, our patients mimic a lot of what's going on with us as a team. So I want to talk a little bit about, just very briefly, and then we're going to go to questions about um, success. And what, while this might seem to be just some, you know, warm and fuzzy ways to find you know, to keep a patient happy, it's it's more than that. At, at foundations, we do a lot around research and uh, really get in touch with our patients to see how they've done, and, and we have a number of questions. We have a baseline that we do when they first come in, and we continue to ask those those questions as uh, all the way up until 18 months. Our most recent data that we received is that our patients report remission after one year of treatment. You'll see the national average and then the foundation's average. And this is not an advertisement for foundations. It's not. I want you to hear that this type of approach can create an opportunity for success for our patients um, long after they've been in our facilities. So the difference between remission and abstinence is important to us. So remission is the patient no longer uh, meets the um, requirements to be uh, an active addiction. So these patients may have may have relapsed, and um, but they have not fallen back into that full experience and expression of their disease as they had been um, before. But the next slide talks about abstinence. Again, this is just shows our four facilities and our percentage of abstinence after a year uh, post discharge. And you'll see the red line. That is the national average. And again, a patient-centered approach, uh, looking at treating dual diagnosis at the same time, you know, as doing what we say we're going to do essentially with the dual diagnosis approach, having a system of care that 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 goes spans across all the all the facilities, and being committed to this patient-centered conversation allows our patients to have complete abstinence at a rate that is something that's really exciting. Um, all the different ways that they're making a difference. It's, um, it's really exciting. So that's um, that's really where I where I can stop and um, give us an opportunity for some questions um, and anything that you may want to talk about as far as um, ways to find it or, or whatever questions that you may have. Um, so I'm going to turn this back over to uh, Julie, I believe. Great. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Uh, this was a great presentation. And before we get to the Q&A portion of today's event, I would like to hand things over to Melanie Melger from Foundations with a few words from our sponsor. Thanks, Julie. Here at Foundations Recovery Network, our grassroots movement called Heroes in Recovery has a simple mission, to eliminate the social stigma that keeps addicted individuals from seeking help, to share stories of recovery for the purpose of encouragement and inspiration, and to create an engaged, sober community that empowers people to get involved give back, and live healthy, active lives. Join us in this mission at our 6K Race Series at these locations across the country. As a thank you for your attendance today, please enjoy the discount code WEBINAR2015 to register for any future 6K event. Back to you, Julie. Great. Thanks so much, Melanie. We've already had a number of questions come in from the audience. However, we would like to remind you that you can use the Q&A widget below the slides on your screen to submit a question at any time. Just type your question in and hit enter. Um, Jennifer, we've had quite a few questions come in and someone in our audience would like to know, how would you go about engaging a client who says that they have no interests 
and no value. Someone who says, I'm not interested in sports or music or art, uh, how would you get that person engaged? That's a great question. I, um, you know, I've, I've had I've had patients sitting in front of me that, for lack of a better word, it was almost like they had failure to thrive. I mean, they just there was no 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 door that could be opened. And so, I would just start there and talk about have them describe what it was what it is like to be right there in that space. Um, have them either write a letter about it or just describe it. Um, but being careful, again, that might not be the right direction if that tends to be a part of their process too, is to sort of just ruminate in that experience. I would also um, have them look for ways that their disease or their mental illness has um, shut off all those opportunities. So, for example, as I was getting history, maybe somebody said that they played football, flag football, and third, fourth grade. I don't know how old you are when you play that. But as they went on, there was no no more discussion about any sport. And so I back up and say, so tell me about when you lost interest in this. And they'll have another reason why they lost interest, like my coach was a jerk or whatever, but it correlates exactly with the divorce of their parents or the introduction of, of drugs. So just trying to help them see that a lot of their loss of, of um, commitment to anything or anything that that sparks them is because drugs, alcohol, their mental illness has taken that space. So I would move them more towards spiritual, um, having that conversation about what is spirituality to them, um, what's authentic to them. Great, thank you. And someone in our audience uh, is talking about uh, some of the obstacles uh, that they might run into in the amount of time it takes for a client and a counselor to identify goals and there's some time constraints there because insurance companies want to have a diagnosis on the very first visit. So can you talk a little bit about the kind of time that it might take to actually work with a treatment-resistant client or someone that you might consider to be a difficult patient? So believe it or not, I, I feel like this process of developing this treatment plan can happen in an hour um, in one of our hour sessions. Now, And I have also found that a... Um, a treatment plan that is robust and very individualized, it, it, it ignites the insurance companies. Uh, our, we are able to get, and I'm just using it as an example, 78% of our days here at Black Bear are residential or detox days. A lot of that has to do with having an incredible UR team and a great team, but at the same time, having a treatment plan that is individualized, it's it's hard for the the, um, the insurance company to push back and see that this is just you know business as usual. Um, but the planning, the, the creating that, that treatment plan assignment can be done within that first meeting. Um, the assessment, if that is your job, if you're the one that has to create the assessment for the insurance companies and that's not done by intake or by a physician, um, there's a lot of information in that, in that process. If you don't have time to do two sessions, you can get that information and say, so I'm going to create this treatment plan, we're going to meet next, and you're going to tell me how this works for you. Trying to capture a couple of things that they said that they enjoyed. Watching them, seeing how they interact with their peers may give you some other information that you didn't have time to collect. Great. And someone in our audience is asking, what is the youngest client that this approach would work with? And do you have some tips about working with younger clients? So that's a good question. It, it speaks to some of my limits professionally. I've only worked with 18 and, and older. That's been the the um, population that I've worked with for all of my career. Um, I, so anything I say would be just my opinion, but, I, but I'm assuming that this approach would work very, very well with even the younger adults uh, simply because it engages them in things that are really close to, to what they enjoy and gets them out of a, out of a more school-type format. But that's a great question, which I'm happy to um, put that out to There's some of, some of uh, therapists here that have worked with younger adults. Okay, great. And someone in our audience would like to know, what tools or strategies do you use to create willingness with a client who might be in treatment involuntarily, someone, for example, in a drug court program? So I would look for any tiny little thing that shows willingness um, and point it out to them. Uh, I was doing lecture just the other day, and, a pay, and I'd asked everyone to be to try to be attentive, the disruptions, you know, just, uh, just we had a huge room. And in the middle of lecture, this one guy who looked like he really didn't want to be there dropped his pen and then was standing up looking all around, making all kinds of noise, trying to find his pen. And I saw that as willingness. I mean, what did he need his pen for? 
he wanted to take notes, you know, and whether or not that's actually what he did, that's what I said. And that's what I pointed out. And the connection between me and that young man was immediate and it lasted the rest of his treatment. So anybody showing up at any certain way, any way at all, there's a level of willingness. It might not be for the same things that we want, but to really acknowledge that they don't want to be in jail. And so they're willing to do what that takes. And so starting there, that's stages of change, motivational interviewing, really using that um, exactly where they are as a good enough motivation and then trying to move them towards the direction that they're actually going in. So just staying out of jail is a fantastic motivation. That's some really good advice. Uh, and someone in our audience asks, uh, is a treatment plan a final document or is it a dynamic document that evolves as the client gains more self-awareness? Oh, thank you for saying that. I didn't even touch on that at all. It is, this, this actually looks like some kind of fantastic one treatment plan with all these assignments on it, and that is not how it is at all. It is very much a fluid um, experience. So I believe very strongly in going back and documenting as the, as the patient completes each objective and sitting with them and, and having a session to, to sort of have closure on, okay, that, you completed that, That's you know, and talking about how that felt for them, what they got out of it, and then moving into talking to the person that sits before you now, a very different person, somebody that's been changed as a result of having 10 days, 15 days sober from the work that they've done, and now they may have different insight, different goals, and so um, creating that space where they can have um, new objectives. So it is very much a very fluid document, so thank you for that question. And Great. And someone in our audience wants to know, how would a therapist incorporate a more active learning environment during a group session? Um, I think that really starts with the, with seeing, you know, from from ground zero, you're going to, going to have to tell them what you're doing. So we have this, we have, you know, Johnny's going to do his his assignment today, and here's what I need you all to do, and um, and here's where we're going to go, and then giving them, enrolling them in the process, really telling them what they're uh, what you expect from them. So I'll do a uh, again speaking of a first step, I'm using that example a lot, but I'll have a, a whole group first step where I write all the questions down on the board, and then. So it's a, a really incredible process where I ask one patient a question and then they answer it. The rest of the group sort of probes and then that person, when they answer the question, will ask another person a question. But I set the stage before it starts of, of what the group dynamic has to be in order for us to be successful. So letting the group know what you need. Um, this is going to be a very, very difficult assignment. I'm going to need everyone to stay put. Can we all commit to that? No getting up to go to the bathroom. Um, John really needs our full attention, um, or giving them, helping them sort of engage in the role that they're being assigned. I have n I've never had a problem with a group um, being willing to participate in, a, in one of these. They, they just, the time goes by so quickly, they all learn something different, even as they're engaged in a different role. Now, this isn't psychodrama or psychomotor. This is simply just allowing them um, to help another one of their peers, and that we all know can create a profound impact alone. Um, and then they also get they get into that place where I want this person to see what we're trying to get them to see, and so that opens up doors in them that we didn't even know existed. So for me, it's mainly telling the group what we're doing, and um, and getting their buy-in in that way, being excited about it, and. Uh, you can tell them this might be a little cheesy and corny, but it's super exciting, and they appreciate that and respect that. Great. And in thinking about the different types of techniques, um, can you give an example of kinesthetic learning, an example activity? I think the, um, the example of having people present lectures. Uh, and again, we would be – now, I'm, this is a, a new term to me, so it might be hurting somebody's head for me to um, destroy what it actually <laughs> means. But from what I understood as I looked it up and read about it and I just was pointed out the other day to me, um, it would be like the lectures. So we often, especially let's say with a patient who's been in treatment multiple times, we want to get them to stop teaching. We want to – you know, the, they don't know – want to say, you don't know everything, and I don't agree with that approach. I think using what they know – so. I, I really love having them present lectures, having them um, present their assignments. So an example of the orthopedic surgeon where he presented a lecture to us about a broken ankle and he drew this ankle on the board. And, and so for him, he was 
he was teaching it. It's also in the interview process. I'll ask a question, and and I'm not being manipulative about it. I really don't know the answer. Um, I'll I'll know just a little bit. I had a patient one time who had a, um, a baseball hat on for the I think it was the Cubs, and I said, "Doesn't that team always lose?" And it, he said, "I'm sorry, excuse me." And I said, oh, "Don't they always lose?" And it, he was he he said. Uh, yeah, it's, and he explained to me the history of the Cubs and what it meant to him, and we ended up using that whole thing as an assignment. Um, so just sort of showing your own, um, just your lack of knowledge around something can really open them up because they have the opportunity to teach you. Um, the M&M one that I had, I actually saw that on a Grey's Anatomy <laughs> So, and I wasn't trying to act like I knew anything about it. I said, "Isn't there this?" I saw this really weird thing called a what well, M and uh, something, and he told me what it was. He described to me what happened in an M M&M, and M, and it was perfect for an assignment for him. But it was in his teaching me that I think it opened up the door. That's great. And someone in our audience is asking, how do you prepare a client for returning to their home environment? Are there some techniques or maybe some type of homework assignments uh, similar that, from what you've talked about in your presentation today that you could send them home with as they're returning to their environment? Um, yes, there's a lot of different – you know, I think talking, talking to them about it, telling them um, that it's not going to look like what they think it looks like, giving them um, some objectives – to complete as they leave treatment. Of course, all the stuff that we all already know, having a great plan set in place from long-term IOP, sober living, all those things are fantastic. But individually, to um, immediately start to tackle some of the things that might be an issue, have a patient call uh, the pharmacies where they may still have drugs and tell them to please destroy them and to please not prescribe, uh, write letters, um, it to different places um, where they may uh, have some risky scenarios that they just want to kind of close those doors. Um, role play, uh, we had a nurse who had never passed a medication without being high. So she role, role played dispensing medication, not real medication and not to anybody, but had this had it sort of a setup where the staff it was only staff that was involved in this one, but she was going to have to pass medications eventually, and so to just get her walk her through what that was going to feel like, um, she had nothing to hand us, um, but but the, we set up the um, the scenario, um, you know, uh, and I I also am, am try to try to be balanced with a relapse prevention plan. I, I, I try to explain that there are, there's an importance to having a relapse prevention plan, but it is also can be a setup that they, they think that they can create um, a plan for every high-risk situation they're going into, when in reality that's not the way it works. They could be in church and have a desire to drink, and then what are they going to do because they don't have that on their plan. So really explaining to them how opportunistic the disease is and um, how it will use any sort of space or place to create a story in which it makes sense to use. So education around how their their disease is going to morph into different, um, into kind of a whole different conversation the longer they're sober, things like that. Great. Well, that's and really good advice. Have, I'm sorry. I was, I was going to say we have stuff like our 6K. We have things that we, we engage them in. We have an alumni program, all those kind of things where we step in and check in on them and, and offer them life challenges to try to do some really exciting things. Fantastic. Well, time has gone really fast for us today. That is all the time we have for questions, but we do have some final instructions regarding CE credit. And again, should you have any issues with this process, we ask that you do not reach out to today's sponsor. They will not be able to assist you in, re in receiving your certificate today. To receive your certificate for today's program, you must click on the green program evaluation widget, complete the evaluation form, and click Submit. For those watching in a group, as a reminder, please download the Group Submission Guide and Program Evaluation located in the Resources area and follow the instructions provided. For those watching from a mobile device or a tablet, you will need to email the Help Desk to receive a program evaluation and a certificate for this program. Please note, CE credit is not available for the archive webinar. It is only available for today's live event. If you have any questions, please click the Contact Webinar Help Desk widget at the bottom of the screen. 
Also, please join us on Tuesday, December 15th, for our upcoming Addiction Professional Webinar, sponsored by Foundations Recovery Network, along with Millennium Health. The program is Trans 101, Making Treatment Safe for Transgender Clients, and it will be presented by Beck G. Cohen. A link will appear on your screen in just a moment for you to register for that event. You can also register by clicking on the Register for Next AP Webinar, sponsored by Foundations, that you'll find at the bottom right of your screen. And once again, I'd like to thank Jennifer Angier for an excellent presentation. I would also like to thank Millennium Health for making today's Foundations Recovery Network program possible. Finally, thank you to everyone in our audience for participating today. We do hope that you'll join us again in the future for another Addiction Professional Webinar. This concludes today's presentation.